It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the last session of today's Ag Outlook and Policy Conference. It's going to be a good one. Today, we have Dr. Ian Sheldon. Ian is a professor and the Anderson's Chair of Agricultural Marketing, Trade, and Policy here at the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics. In addition to being a fellow of the Society of Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, Ian has been a great help to me in, in getting established here as I start my career and has a long history of studying trade and trade policy, uh, both in the U.S. as well as internationally. And so this is going to be a great talk, and I'm, and I'm really looking forward to it. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Ian. Thank you very much, Margaret, for that kind introduction. I was, I was trying to find my mute button on, on the Zoom bar. So thanks everybody for coming back this afternoon. Um, it's uh, as always a pleasure for me to be talking at this conference about international trade. And as you can see from my, my title uh, today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the prospects for agricultural trade uh, and also what I think might be the prospects for US trade policy. So, of course my slides don't want to move. Here we go. So like the other talks before us, I've, I've laid out a little bit of a guide to, to where I'm gonna be going today so that you can, can follow the argument. So first of all, I'm going to give um, an outlook for US agricultural trade. Uh, that'll focus on where we are in the aggregate, where we are by some major commodities, uh, where we are with our major markets. And I've also included a slide today about um, agricultural exports from the state of Ohio. I, I don't typically include a slide for that, but, and I'll explain why um, I've, I've put one in this year. Then I'm going to move on to talk about global food prices. So uh, this morning we heard a lot from Zoe Blackias about um, US food price inflation and how that relates to uh, global value chains, global supply chains. Today I'm going to talk about um, the issue that matters to the United Nations uh, Food and Agricultural Organization is what's happening with global food prices because we're not only seeing these local national effects in prices, we're seeing international effects. And that has different uh, implications for economic welfare to, to the ones we're thinking about here in the US. Then I'm gonna give you an outlook for, for US trade policy. Um, for the last nine months, uh, 11 months since the new administration came into office. Initially, things were pretty quiet on the trade policy front, but I do have a number of things to uh, bring to your attention that have been happening over the past couple of months. And then that will lead me into finishing out my presentation by giving you an evaluation of where the US-China phase one trade agreement is, both generally and with respect to agriculture. So let me start with, um, a discussion about the outlook for US agricultural trade. So when I look back to what I talked about last year, what surprised us was that throughout 2020, after the initial shock of the pandemic, and then moving into the first part of 2021, that global agricultural trade was actually quite resilient. Um, it came as a surprise to many of us. In fact, global agricultural trade uh, did a lot better actually than, than overall manufacturing trade. It, 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 the, the cliff it fell off was not as deep and it came out of, the, uh, of that recession, if you like, a lot faster than the manufacturing sector did. And, it, and global agri agricultural trade has continued to be uh, resilient in terms of volume and value uh, through 2021 to where we are right now. That's pretty much being driven by China's imports of oil seeds, and that would be predominantly soybeans, uh, corn and coarse grains. And amongst coarse grains, uh, we've seen uh, big increases in their imports of sorghum, for example, uh, as, as an animal feed. And much of that has been driven by a very rapid rebuilding of their hog production capacity after the, the outbreak of African swine fever that they suffered a few years ago. And in fact, 
pod production capacities uh, really being built up very fast in China. In fact, it may even be peaking right now. And it looks like uh, pork prices are actually softening in China uh, right now. So in terms of um, US agricultural exports, so these are the most recent numbers uh, put out by the United States Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service. So typically what happens, you get a WASD report um, in early to mid August, and then they put out a, a trade report, which um, sort of digs a bit deeper into the, the trade forecast. Uh, the latest forecast for November uh, comes out next week. So there may be a little bit of uh, adjustment to these numbers, but these numbers look pretty robust, I think. So for 2021, U.S. agricultural exports are forecast to hit um, just over $173 billion. And in 2020, going into 2022, they're forecast to hit a record uh, $177.5 billion. Now, that needs to be put in some kind of perspective um, in the following couple of senses. First of all, um, United States Department of Agriculture, through the Foreign Ag Service, has recently changed the way that it defines agricultural products that get traded. And for consistency, sort of globally, they're using the, the World Trade Organization definition of agricultural products. And what that means is that for 2018 20, that period, uh, exports per year are higher on average by about $4.7 billion. So some of that increase we're seeing for 2020 going into 2021 and then on to 2022 is partly driven by the fact that there's been a, a redefinition of the data. And you also have to understand that these are uh, nominal data. So there's a, there's, a, there's a price effect in here and you may have been reading about how physical export quantities, uh, particularly for soybeans, may be softening a little bit, especially to China, but we're still gonna see pretty high export values, um, particularly for soybeans, uh, cotton and horticultural products. So here's a graphic that gives you a, a flavor of where US agricultural exports and US agricultural imports have gone over the past, um, what, 30, 30 or so years. And I think there's a couple of things you can take away from this, pretty much from 1990 through till when the trade war began in 2018. Uh, this was a bright spot uh, for the United States in terms of uh, the current account. Uh, agriculture pretty much ran uh, a pretty significant trade surplus, um, exports minus imports. Over those 30 years, it dipped necessarily when the trade war began and we lost a huge amount of market share in China. But if you look from 2020 onwards, uh, you'll see that we've gone back into the black, and that's mostly driven by uh, China uh, putting all this uh, investment into their hog production capacity. And also, I think it's, it's also driven by the phase one US-China trade agreement. So you can see there for 2022, we're looking at a pretty healthy um, uh, export surplus uh, in the agricultural sector, which I think is a bright spot uh, that's being forecast for next year for agricultural trade. If we look at uh, the most important markets uh, that we're exporting to, it probably won't come as much of a surprise to anybody in the audience who pays attention to international agricultural trade that um, China in 2022 is forecast uh, to be importing a record $39 billion worth of agricultural exports and China is forecast to remain our number one export market um, as, as we move into 20, the 2022 um, agricultural year. And then probably not surprisingly, uh, Canada is our second most important export market uh, followed by uh, Mexico. And of course, Canada and Mexico are both part of what we used to call the North American Free Trade Agreement and now we call uh, the US-Mexico-Canada uh, Agreement. Um, pretty much we have free trade in agricultural products in North America. This is one of the most integrated free trade agreements um, outside of the European Union. So in combination, they add up to being our most important market, but China's the most important uh, individual market. If we look a little bit around the world, 
um, you can see that um, that Europe is, um, you know, in aggregate is probably our um, third most, fourth most important market. Uh, but of course, Europe, like Canada, is a mature market. Uh, the big issue with Europe, I think, is the fact that they maintain very high food safety standards, uh, particularly for things like the import of beef and the import of poultry products um, that constrain the ability of the United States, particularly to export uh, beef and poultry into that market. You'll notice that um, my home country is, is uh, somewhat less important than the European Union. Um, the UK, of course, has left the European Union via Brexit. Um, there's been a lot of debate in the United Kingdom about the possibility that the US and the UK uh, could sign a free trade agreement, but I think that's kind of on hold right now. And a lot of that's being driven by uh, the incumbent British government's attitude towards the relationship between Great Britain, the island of Great Britain, uh, Northern Ireland, which is still part of the United Kingdom, but lies inside uh, the single market of the European Union and its relationship physically with the Republic of Ireland. And there's a lot of hot air, I think, coming out from Boris Johnson and his trade negotiator with the EU about uh, what they call the Northern Ireland Protocol, which uh, lays down a barrier to trade in the Irish Sea between Great Britain and the island of Ireland. Uh, but you have to remember that the, the border between the North and the South of Ireland is meant to be maintained as open under the Good Friday Agreement, which was the agreement that ended the civil war in Northern Ireland in the late 1990s. And both President Biden and uh, leader of the House, Nancy Pelosi, have made it very clear that they're unhappy with the possibility that the Good Friday Agreement would be undermined. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about trade policy later, but I don't see any major free trade agreements being negotiated by the United States um, in the near future. Turning now to uh, individual uh, US agricultural exports. So on the right hand side there, you can see the 2022 forecast uh, is um, headed there by soybeans. That's a, a record amount of exports is expected in 2022. That's a, still a forecast of 32.3 billion. That may be adjusted uh, in the November numbers. Uh, you will see that follow that that's an aggregation of meat products. So that covers beef, poultry, um, and pork exports. Um, I saw this morning in Farm Doc that we're seeing record exports of beef uh, to China, and we've seen very, very um, fast exports of, of pork in particular to China over the last 12, 18 months as they've um, been real rebuilding their own hog production capacity, but um, their own meat consumption has been very strong. You'll see corn there is the third ranked uh, of the products the way that I've defined them, $17.1 billion um, next year, followed uh, at the bottom by dairy products and, and wheat uh, are tracking pretty closely together. Now, I did say that I was gonna introduce a slide here uh, relating to a higher agricultural exports. Now, the reason that I'm always a little bit leery about presenting data on, on exports by state is that we don't collect data on exports by states. By definition, exports are the unit of, of, of definition is the country. And so we track exports of soybeans, wheat, corn, you, 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 you name it, when it leaves a, a port, be it the Gulf or the Pacific Northwest or Los Angeles or Savannah or Baltimore. And we don't explicitly collect data on the export of agricultural commodities by state. But the United States Department's Economic Research Service has for a number of years uh, approximated what they think are exports by state. Now they used to do this by taking the share of a state in uh, agricultural production, either in total or by commodity, and then would say the share of agricultural production is going to be their share of US exports. 
And in the last few years, uh, the Economic Research Service has um, reworked the way they calculate exports by state, and they now do it based upon the share of US farm cash receipts for products in each state. So these are the numbers. Um, so the way I would look at these data are, I'm pretty confident that those total number, that total number for 2021, and by the way, uh, the most recent data from ERS go up to 2020, the 2021 numbers are my back of the envelope forecast. So next year I'll come back with this graph and you can see how well I've managed to perform in my forecast. I'm gonna do what Ben Brown and Alan Lines have always done over the years, which is to see how good my, my forecasting is. So I figure about $4.81 billion worth of exports from Ohio from the agricultural sector next year. And just like the national level, Ohio's exports are dominated by soybeans. About 2 billion is my expectation for 2021 going out into 2022. And then lower down the ranking, you see meat products and, and corn. So um, this pretty much tracks what you see in the national data. So the way I would look at these numbers are, is they give a good sense of the ranking. And I think they give a good sense of the direction of where exports are likely to go in the next year, but I, but I wouldn't put uh, too big um, a faith in the exact uh, numbers that, that I've got written here in the slide. Now let me move on to talk about global food prices. Um, remember this morning, if you were here, uh, Zoe Plakias talked in great detail about what's been happening to, to food prices. Uh, in the United States. This is a debate that's going on elsewhere. Um, I follow, as, as I originally come from the UK, as many of you know, I still follow what's going on back there. And our food prices are, are, are way up this year. And there's a real concern going into the winter that a combination of high food prices, cuts in social benefits, um, the impact of Brexit on food prices is actually pushing up food price, in, food price inflation. And whereas here in the US you worry about the price of turkey for Thanksgiving, uh, in the UK, of course, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving, we eat turkey at Christmas time. And there's a real big concern that for just the similar reasons here that there's a lack of labor in the processing plants to slaughter the turkeys and they're really concerned about the price of an average Christmas dinner uh, back home in the UK. So many of the things that Zoe talked about this morning with respect to domestic food prices, the impact of global supply chain and domestic supply chain uh, pinch points hold over for other countries like the United Kingdom. But because I think about these things in an international context, what I watch is the Food and Agricultural Organization Food Price Index. This is the food and agricultural outfit of the United Nations. And their food price index is up 31.8 points from, in, from October last year. So if you look at this graphic here, it's pretty clear. The red line is 2021 food prices uh, through October. And you can see how there's been, uh, over this past year, there's been a significant jump in global food prices compared to 2020 when the pandemic started uh, and considerably higher than it was in 2018, 2019. What's really interesting to those of us who follow world food prices is um, food prices this year, both in nominal and real terms, are now at the highest level globally that they've been since the food price spikes that we observed back here in 2000, 2011. Many of you in the audience may remember that food price spike. Uh, we were talking about then the perfect storm in back in those days was driven by declining yields, uh, climate effects, uh, the impact of biofuels on the amount of um, corn and uh, oil seeds being taken out of the food production system and how that was impacting food prices. And we'd had another food price spike in 2008. And much of these food price spikes were exacerbated by uh, many countries, including India, China, Thailand, Vietnam, Russia, Ukraine, coming in with uh, export taxes that simply exacerbated these food price 
increases. Uh, this time round in 2021, we saw, and I reported on this last year in my presentation, we saw early on in the pandemic, a few countries implementing uh, export taxes or export bans, particularly for rice and wheat by countries uh, like Vietnam and Thailand and Russia early on. Uh, but under a lot of pressure from the WTO, the World Trade Organization, many countries backed away from export taxes. So I don't think we're seeing this price rise being driven quite as much as it was back in 2011 by, by policy choices, by particularly by exporting developing countries. So just going back, so the, these prices are now at the highest level since July 2001, driven mostly by increased prices of vegetable oils and cereals. And the, the thing that I'm really paying attention to, um, and if you go and look at FarmDoc, um, I, as I looked at FarmDoc news over the last six months, a common story was about what was happening in the world wheat market. And we've seen a significant surge in world wheat prices over the last uh, nine, 12 months. And this has been driven by weather shocks, uh, we had a significant drought impact in Canada. So Canada, as you know, is a, is a major exporter of uh, red wheat for, for bread production. Um, and they were suffering a drought um, up in the, the, the wheat producing states over there in the Western provinces of Canada. Um, and also Russia had uh, bad weather as well earlier on in the year. We're also seeing historically tight stocks. Um, as you know, what the FAO worries about is the relationship between the use of wheat and the stocks of wheat. And there's a real concern that the gap between use and stocks is tightening quite significantly for this commodity. And we're seeing tighter export stocks in the United States and Canada. And from what I've been reading, uh, as China started to increase its animal feed consumption. Um, it started to use up some of its own wheat stocks and it's trying to replenish some of those wheat stocks by importing wheat. We've also seen very strong import demand on the wheat side um, as other countries are replenishing their stocks, uh, mostly because of uh, weather shocks in their, their own economies, uh, particularly in the Middle East. We've seen countries like Iran, Iraq, uh, Turkey's a big uh, producer, particularly of durum wheat, um, which gets used, of course, in both pasta uh, and couscous, as well as in bread products. And uh, Afghanistan, of course, given the situation Afghanistan is facing, uh, has also been going into the, the global market to try to replenish its own stocks. And the thing about uh, wheat is, of course, there are three main uh, subsistence commodities that are important in, in the world market. And they are rice, um, well, actually four, rice, uh, oil seeds, of course, which is then uh, processed into vegetable oils and to animal feed, corn, which of course is processed into animal feed, and then wheat. And wheat, of course, is consumed far more directly than those other commodities bar rice, uh, and particularly uh, for things like bread, um, in some in some developing countries, uh, and obviously things like pasta and couscous and other commodities elsewhere. And the surge in prices of wheat and the, the, the effect that they're having on global food prices overall is having a major impact on low income consumers in developing countries. So just like Zoe talked about food insecurity here in the United States, which is a problem of relative poverty, in the developing world, uh, we're talking about uh, absolute poverty. We're talking about people living off a dollar, two dollars a day, which is the World Bank's measure of poverty of facing a major increase in the cost of their food. And if we look back at what happened in 2008, 2010, 2011, this can have quite serious uh, social effects on social unrest and, and political unrest. And it's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds in combination with the way that these countries have been handling the pandemic. So let me talk a little bit about um, commodity supply chains. So unlike Zoe, 
uh, who talked about food supply chains and she talked about the movement not just of inputs but also of semi-processed goods and processed goods that, that end up on the supermarket shelves. I'm going to be talking mostly about the commodity supply chains. So Hi, everyone. It looks like uh, Dr. Sheldon froze, so we're going to try to get him back. If you could just hang tight for a moment. Thank you so much. So luckily our moderator, uh, Dr. Jadlowski is right down the hall from Dr. Sheldon. So she's gonna um, run down there and see if we can get an alternate setup. So thanks again for your patience. When it rains, it pours, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> uh, thank you everyone for bearing with us. Uh, this unexpected technical issue, uh, Ian's entire computer froze, so he had to restart, uh, which he is doing now. Um, fortunately, we are all in the office together, even if we are socially distanced. So I was just able to run over and tell him that he was frozen and um, he will be back online in the next couple of minutes. So thank you again for your patience and Hopefully you can enjoy this nice little break to reflect on what, what Ian has already shared with us and we will be back shortly.
So I seem to be back. Holly, can you hear me? Yep, you are good, Dr. Sheldon. Okay, I um, apologize to everybody online. For, I got zoomed out, so to speak. Uh, and I came into my office today because they were replacing a telegraph pole outside my house and we had a power outage. So I come to my office and my assistant crashes here. So this is, I was informed by Margaret that this is where um, everything broke down. So um, as I was saying before, I, I, I got, my whole system froze up, that when we look at global supply chains and commodities, only about 10% of US grain exports are transported in containers. And this compares to say dairy products, uh, which are you know, majorly being affected by both container capacity and port issues. And there was a very good article in the New York Times over the weekend about this. Now, in terms of uh, global supply chains, it's certainly the case that there were some breakdowns in commodity exports from the United States when Hurricane Ida came through back in August. And this did affect US grain shipments from the Gulf in September through damage to port facilities and there were power outages. Um, but if you look at, uh, these are the, this is the data from last week from, this, this is from the 11th of November, this is the report that comes out of USDA, the Foreign Ag Service. The, the red line is current year weekly, uh, weekly soybean shipments, and that's compared to the blue line, which is last year. Uh, um, and then the current year, sorry, the five-year average is green. So it looks like um, through September through October, uh, we were running below previous years, uh, physical shipments of, of soybeans. Uh, and now we're just shifting a little bit above that. Although if I look at the data that Ben Brown works with, which is the weekly export inspections, it looks like we're just about tracking uh, where we were for the three year average. Uh, similarly, if you look at, this is weekly corn shipments. Uh, weekly corn shipments look like they're pretty much running where they were uh, for last year as well as in compared to the five year average. But the thing I think you need to pay attention to in global commodity supply chains is there's been a significant increase in marine shipping costs. And pretty much three things are driving that. One is what we call um, bunker fuel. So bunker fuel is the diesel fuel that powers um, uh, large scale container ships and importantly here, large scale bulk commodity carriers. Um, and I have a couple of graphics here. This is marine transport costs out of the Gulf ports and out of the Pacific Northwest, uh, necessarily the Pacific Northwest costs uh, track lower than the Gulf uh, because pretty much our exports are going to, to mostly to, to Asia. So they'd be shipping out of the Pacific. But you can see in the past year, bulk grain transportation costs to Japan. This, these are data out of uh, the Ag Marketing Service of US, USDA. This is indexed on the year 2000 of 100. You can see there's been pretty much a, a doubling of the transport cost index over the last year. So there really has been a significant bump in marine transport costs. Uh, here's another way of looking at those transport costs. Um, these are data out of the Baltic International Marine data. Um, these go back uh, monthly data for two years. This is one year uh, dry bulk charter rates. So this is how much it costs per day in dollars uh, to rent space in a large bulk carrier. And you'll see that this is defined by the different sizes of, of merchant ships. So a Cape size ship, these are the very largest bulk carriers uh, these are the ones that uh, are too large to go through either the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal. Um, they um, go around the capes. So that would be the red line. Anything that can go through the Panama Canal is that uh, the sort of blue turquoise line. Supermax and handy size, these are the, uh, the, the smaller uh, bulk commodity carriers. But I think the point to, to note 
is that since uh, December of last year, just like those bulk commodity rates uh, for grain uh, out of the Pacific Northwest and the Gulf, uh, you're seeing a very significant increase in dry bulk charter rates. So I think that's the important thing to note about what's been happening to merchant shipping costs. But of course, this is not just a fuel cost story. Uh, this is also um, uh, about bulk shipping capacity constraints. So this is where we get sense similarities, but it's not for quite the same reason. In the container industry, uh, we don't necessarily have enough containers. We don't necessarily have enough space to store those containers in ports or even get those containers off the container ships onto the quayside, onto the back of a truck or onto the railroads. That's what's driving the, um, the time problems, the logistical problems in the, in the container ports, particularly Long Beach here in the United States and ports elsewhere on the East Coast and also in Europe. But the thing about um, the merchant shipping industry capacity is to use the economics jargon, the, the supply, so we've had a big run up in demand for, for shipping, both containerized shipping and bulk shipping. So demand is pretty flexible, but supply of shipping is not flexible. So to the economists in the audience, this is what we call in the short run, uh, supply of merchant shipping capacity is inelastic. In other words, yeah, demand goes up, but it takes time to um, either build or restock uh, new capacity in merchant shipping. And so the, this, in other words, in the short to medium term, this demand shock has come up against a transportation capacity constraint. And you can see that um, uh, these are in numbers. I've, I've started to get really interested in the merchant shipping industry um, uh, in the last few months. Uh, my late father-in-law was a merchant seaman growing up, so I, I sort of have that connection in my own family back to this industry. And these are data about the growth in the dry bulk ship fleet. So the, the, the and this is in millions of deadweight tons. Uh, and it's the left-hand index. And on the right-hand side, you have the percentage growth rate in deadweight tons per annum. So the blue bars are delivered shipping capacity, marine shipping capacity. Uh, the sort of turquoisey blue, light blue line, uh, that's the negative line, that's the demolition of old capacity. Then the light blue numbers would be what's to be delivered. And you can see that there is quite a bit of shipping uh, in the shipyards ready to be delivered. But overall, there's been a, since uh, 2019, there's been a, a decline in the growth rate of um, capacity in the merchant shipping industry. And I think that's what's coming up against this significant demand shock that we're seeing, uh, particularly for bulk commodities globally. And then the other thing to add in this, and again, this relates back to what Zoe was talking about this morning, there have been much longer port turnaround times. So this is largely due uh, to workforce shortages on the dock side. And so you get these uh, lines of merchant ships queuing up in, in the water outside of the major ports. And many of you may have seen pictures uh, outside of Long Beach. We've seen pictures out of the major ports uh, in the Northeast of China, uh, in Europe, and that's those, those turnaround times, you need to add to those to the capacity constraints and the rising fuel costs is all adding to the increase in costs, which are then feeding in to the cost of, of, of shipping grain and grain prices generally around the world. So now let me talk about uh, US trade policy um, and my, my, my sense of, of that, I, given that I had a we lost a little bit of time there. I'll try to finish this discussion up in, uh, in about five to 10 minutes, if that's okay with, with Margaret, who's running this session. So between 2016 and 2020, I was a really busy guy, uh, answering a lot of questions from the media and elsewhere about the previous administration's trade policy 
and in particular the run-up to the trade war in 2018-2019. Since the new administration has come into office, things have sort of quietened down a little bit, and we didn't hear, really hear very much about trade policy, certainly over the first five, six months of the administration being in office, I think they had other things that they were taking care of, uh, notably the reaction to the pandemic and the infrastructure bill, etc. But I think there's a, we are seeing some underlying changes in trade policy, which I think are important to pay attention to. First of all, we're seeing trade tensions being eased with the European Union. Uh, and I think that's important for a number of reasons. So uh, the EU, not so much that it's a major trading, trading partner, but it's a major player in multilateral trade negotiations along with the United States. And I think this is healthy that uh, things are being relaxed between the United States and the EU with the potential that may lead to um, some easing up of tensions uh, at the WTO and maybe moving us ahead at the WTO in terms of uh, getting the uh, dispute settlement mechanism up and running again, particularly judges being elected to the appellate board, which has been on ice since late 2019. So this past June, uh, the United States and the EU finally reached a truce in a very long running trade dispute over export subsidies to wide body jet aircraft. That's the Boeing Airbus dispute, which has pretty much been on off since 2004. So the good thing there is that the WTO sanctioned tariffs have been suspended by both sides. And that was something that I think President Biden and the European Commission were seeking to try to reach a resolution outside of the WTO about that particular trade, a trade, I wouldn't even call it a spat. It's been a, it's in fact been the most important trade dispute at the WTO in the history of the WTO. Very recently, this past October, the United States and the European Union have also ended their dispute over steel and aluminum tariffs, which were implemented by the US in 2018. And they're agreeing to work together on reducing global excess capacity. And importantly, the, the EU has removed many of the important retaliatory tariffs that they implemented in 2018 against quite famous American products, including Harley Davidson motorbikes, um, bourbon. Uh, obviously, that was originally targeted um, at um, Mitch McConnell when he was leader of the Senate and Levi's jeans. And so the EU has uh, acted pretty, pretty quickly in removing those tariffs. The U, what the US has done, the US has removed its tariffs, but it's implemented a tariff rate quota system, whereby there are target amounts of imports of aluminum and steel that they're willing to accept from the EU. And the EU seems quite happy with this because it doesn't, they don't think that they're actually gonna hit those maximum import quotas. And so I think the EU and the US seem to be quite happy with the way that's working out. But the problem might come if other steel exporters feel like that they're losing market share to the EU in the resolution of, of the bilateral dispute between the US and the EU. But I do think on, on, on balance, this is a positive outcome for trade relations. Moving on to China, the new US trade representative, Catherine Tay, who has replaced the outgoing trade representative, uh, Robert Lighthizer, she has restarted back channel trade talks with China. Uh, as you know, President Biden is having talks with President Xi Jinping of China right now, but the trade representative is working on trade issues uh, behind, the, behind, behind the scenes. Having said that, there's no sign yet that either US or Chinese tariffs are gonna be removed anytime soon. Although President Biden's administration has reestablished the process by which US importers are allowed to seek tariff relief from any import tariffs imposed against China. The focus of the US trade representative though is very much on China's industrial subsidies. Uh, this is what started the trade war in the first place. And there's a threat of a new section, this is US trade policy, that section 301 investigation uh, of US industrial and export subsidies with the potential for new US tariffs. 
And I am concerned that agriculture will be caught in the crossfire again if trade hostilities ramp up. So as well as these things, a lot of pressure is being put on China to meet its import commitments under the phase one trade agreement. And I'll just finish out with a few comments about that and we'll, we'll go to questions. So in terms of the agreed targets for overall US exports to China, it's looking like certainly as of September, 2021, that we're going to short, that the shortfall is going to be 39% below target with exports only slightly above what the 2017 levels were before the trade war began. If we look just at manufacturing exports, which account for the majority of the covered goods under that agreement, again, the shortfall looks like about 39%, with particularly poor performance for manufacturing exports, which are driven by significant shortfalls in US exports of aircraft, 81% below target, and automobile exports to China, which are 62% below target. And those industries which were picked out by China for retaliatory tariffs were devastated in terms of export market share in 2018, 2019. So on those grounds, it's perhaps reasonable to argue that the trade agreement as it covers manufacturing really hasn't worked that well. And I think that's where the pressure is being targeted against China. But when we look at agriculture, Agricultural exports look like they've actually been a little bit of a bright spot in terms of the trade agreement. Currently, our exports are 84% of, of target as of September 2021, although we are likely still to fall short of commitment. So this graphic gives you a pretty good idea of what's been happening with agricultural exports. So the, the red line are the targets, the blue line are the actual purchases, the green line is the prorated 2017 purchases. So at the end of 2020, we were 82% of the target for that year. And it looks like we're going to be at 84% of the 2020, 2020, 2021 target. And of course, I think there's a little bit of room for that gap to close uh, in the final couple of months here of 2021. So I'm, I think if you go back to what I thought in Late, Jan late 2019, early 2020, I was pretty pessimistic that we would meet and get anywhere meeting these targets. So I was definitely a glass half empty guy uh, back in those days. But now I think I'm a glass, if not more than half a glass full guy on this. I think China's done pretty well at meeting those import targets, all things being considered. If we break it down by commodity, and then I'll finish up because it's uh, 150. Uh, as of August 2021, um, in fact, I'll just show you this graphically. It's easier to see it graphically. On the left-hand side, you'll see soybeans. Um, as of uh, August 2021, that's where the data go up to. We were 64% of hitting the soybean target. So we're quite a ways below hitting the prorated target for US exports of soybeans to China under the agreement. But then look at the right hand side, corn has just gone gangbusters. So by late August of this year, we were over a thousand percent above the 2021 target. And if we look at wheat, we're pretty much on target for wheat. And we've done really well in terms of being well over target for pork exports. And that's also the case for sorghum exports uh, and um, yeah, sorghum exports. And it looks like beef exports are doing really, really well. So, you know, my gut feeling is that um, we've done pretty well compared to the overall imports by China under the agreement. We've done pretty well in agriculture. But the question I'm going to leave you with, and I'll leave this as an open question, is are those imports by China due to the agreement itself and the pressure put on China, or is it due to other factors, particularly China rebuilding its swine production capacity uh, over the last two years? So Margaret, um, I'm gonna finish there. Um, I apologize for my, my 
my computer breaking down. Fortunately, Margaret's in an office two yards away from me. She was able to knock on my door and I did what I always do, which was hit the reboot button. So sorry for the break. Um, we're back online and I'm ready to answer questions. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Ian. Turn it off and turn it back on again. That's uh, the solution to computers and maybe also to uh, trade policy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have two questions in the chat already. Uh, as you might expect, this is a very hot topic and everyone is very excited to hear more. So I'll start with the first question we got from an anonymous attendee who asks, how much decrease in exports of soybeans can we expect when South American crops become available in February 2022? Yeah, that's, um, that's a very good question. And um, I think from, and in fact, I was talking again, visiting with Ben Brown this morning about this. And if you come back tomorrow, maybe Seung Ki will be able to talk a little bit about how the WASDI forecasts about soybean production may impact exports, but it's certainly the case that USDA is forecasting um, a high value of exports of soybeans, uh, particularly to China, but on lower quantities. So some of that, what we're observing in trade is a revenue versus a quantity effect. And I think, um, you know, based on what Ben is talking to me about is that uh, even at the peak of the, UK, of the US harvest, it, it still seems that Brazilian soybeans are cheaper. Although I look at the data, um, export costs out of um, Latin America, particularly Argentina, they're being affected by another issue, which is the falling level of the Piranha River has, is driving up some of their transport costs. So there are other shocks to the transport system that might also feed into these costs. Uh, ben also suggested another reason for the slowdown of, and I've seen this in the farm doc discussions as well, is that we that soy, Chinese soybean crush has actually been slow. So the Chinese import soybeans, crush it and then feed it to hogs. Um, and some of that is being driven by energy, uh, energy effects, uh, gas supply shortages in the in the region where they 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 crush soybeans. There, there've been um, power outages, uh, but also because uh, hog feeding margins, I mentioned this in my presentation, I've been reading this online, is that there are too many hogs now in China. They're slaughtering hogs, they're driving down the, hog, the, the pork price, uh, and that's dri driving down margins in, in pork production, which is feeding into a slowdown in crush, crush margins, and sorry, crushing, and I think a slowdown, a softening, in soybean export. So that's a very long answer to the question, but I think that's what we're seeing. And my gut feeling is when we look at the November forecast for soy, US soybean exports, I think we'll have seen a softening of that number. Uh, it won't be that record um, 32 billion. I think it's gonna be a little bit softer than that, and particularly to China. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question in the Q&A comes from Alan Lines, and he first says, thanks for the great presentation, and then asks, can you help me understand the trade relations between Brazil and Ukraine and importers like China and the EU? So, uh, hi, Alan. Um, I knew you were going to ask me a question. In fact, I told Margaret I expect to get a question from Alan. I apologize for the breakdown mid, um, mid, um, mid presentation. So let me, let me check. Um, can you bring up the wording of the question, Margaret, so I know and I see the wording? You should be able to see it if you hit Q&A. Um, I can read it to you again if, if that no, would be I got helpful. It. I, got, I got it. Okay. Thank you. Great. So so let me see. So Brazil, Ukraine, and importers like China and the EU. Well, Alan, you know, to be quite honest, I pay most of my attention to the, the two biggest producers of soybeans, and that's uh, the United States and Brazil. And I think most of what we're seeing in global prices and 
the way exports flow out of the US and Brazil is driven by you know, weather conditions here in the United States as we come into the harvest, weather conditions in the Southern Hemisphere. And as I follow FarmDoc, you know, when they talk about prices moving in China and prices moving globally, I think a lot of that's driven by uh, mostly in soybeans um, with respect to Brazil and, and, and the United States and Chinese demand. But when we look at wheat, and I think wheat's uh, maybe the commodity you're thinking about. Um, wheat, when we look at what, if you go back six months, the real concern with wheat exports was what had happened in Canada with its drought, what had happened in the, the rain impact on the Russian wheat exports, and then actually Russia, and I didn't mention this in my presentation, but Russia's playing, Russia's, Russia's playing around with its export policies. And in fact, they had an export tax on wheat for a while, which I think was feeding in to global wheat prices. Then a few weeks ago, I look at the, the, wheat, for, the wheat price forecasts and, and exports, and it looks like the Ukraine, I guess in competition to some extent with Argentina, with other countries, was starting to increase its exports, uh, particularly into the European Union and, and other developing countries. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of these things are driven by very short run weather effects, short run supply effects, uh, transportation cost effects, policy effects, throw into that the pandemic as well, and then Brexit effects uh, and what's going on in the EU. And it's, it's pretty hard to tease out everything that's going on. But right now, if I were to, as I said to my talk, I'm following wheat mostly because of its importance to subsistence consumption. And I think the declining stocks are what we need to be paying attention to. And it's not just stocks in the US and, and, and China, uh, it's stocks elsewhere. And I think that's somewhat concerning. Uh, and we, you know we, we may have big weather shocks again this coming season. So again, a kind of long-winded answer to your question, but as always, Alan, you caught me coming out of left field with the question. So I sort of trying to think on my feet there. Thanks, Alan, great to hear from you. Okay, so I, I, can uh, read, I do you wanna read the question, uh, Margaret? Absolutely. Um, I was gonna say your ability to predict the questions you get is hopefully just as good as your ability to predict trade policy. <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, Jackie Fatka asks, well, first she says, great presentations by all today. Thank you, Jackie. And then she asks, we keep hearing we need a proactive trade stance from this administration, but nothing from this administration looks to be proactive for agriculture. What is your outlook for the next three years for this administration? What changes do you see for a resumption of talks with the UK, Kenya, or even re-entering CT, CP, TPP, as so many in ag want. Okay, so I, I see this is a four, four part question. Yeah. So part one, um, what is my outlook for the next three years for this administration? So Jackie, um, first of all, I do think the proactive moves on easing up tensions with the European Union, particularly on steel and aluminum is quite important. The Boeing and the Boeing Airbus case is so huge and it's been around for such a long time that I'm, it's not obvious to me how much that's gonna to add to the overall easing of tensions. It's, it's, it was pretty much resolved as far as I'm concerned. Now, I would argue, Jackie, that it was the steel aluminum dispute in the first place that started the whole mess back in 2018. The administration was not seeking to disrupt agricultural trade at the time. It was mostly concerned about Chinese subsidies to production of steel and aluminum, the dumping of those commodities in the world market. It was concerned about the theft of intellectual property, the lack of an agreement over investment, discrimination against US firms. That's what led to the trade dispute. But China was very savvy and targeted exports of agricultural commodities into China as a way of 
seeking a resolution to the to 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 the U.S. implementing bilaterally tariffs against China. So I think the U.S. got sucked. Sorry, China and the U.S. started a trade war. Agriculture got sucked into that trade war and was in some ways collateral damage to the rest of what was going on. And so I see the, the combination of the US-China agreement and the relaxation of trade negotiations with the EU as a sort of a move towards uh, relaxing some of this. Now, you're asking me about trade talks with the UK, Kenya, or even re-entering uh, CPTPP, for most people in the audience, I'm going to just refer to that to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The UK ain't going to happen right now. And the reason it's not going to happen, and I mentioned this earlier in my, in my discussion, is for one thing, um, I don't think it would change trade relations that much between the UK and the US. They're pretty mature trade relations. But having said that, I think the UK is quite an important potential market for US exports, particularly in the meat and, meat and poultry sector. And the, there are two stumbling blocks. One is political and it's Northern Ireland and the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And quite frankly, and I'm gonna be honest here and you can, you can ding me if you want, but Boris Johnson and his trade negotiator negotiated the agreement that relates to the relationship between the North of Ireland, Great Britain, and the Republic of Ireland. It's the UK that wants to backtrack on this and backslide. And so I think the people in Congress and the, including the president who of course has um, Irish heritage um, is very unhappy about the risk that poses to peace in Northern Ireland and the relationship between the Republic of Ireland and the North. So I think that's a key reason why you're not gonna see a free trade agreement between the United States and the UK, however much the UK would like it. Secondly, um, the UK is currently trading on EU food safety standards. And I'm particularly concerned that there's gonna be a blow up between the politicians in the UK and British consumers and the trade negotiators in the UK and the US over food standards. And the US made it pretty clear under the previous administration, they wanted to see a relaxation of what they perceived to be protectionist food safety standards as they relate to consumption of beef and particularly consumption of poultry. And here I'm talking about chlorinated chicken, which really exercises the British consumer. So I don't see much movement on that. TPP, TPP, if I was advising the administration, I would say, get right back to it. But the US left and a lot, of, it's not necessarily the, the US that can seek re-entry. It's gonna be, will the current members of CPTPP be willing to re-invite the United States to join? So right now, I don't see any conversation about that you'll hear people meet, like me saying, hey, we gave up a lot, especially in agriculture, for not, rejoin, for not joining it or not remaining in it in the first place. Kenya, I'm not hearing anything about that. I think the negotiations, negotiations are still ongoing, but I'm not sure how important in the big schema of this for things that actually is. I don't know how much we're exporting to Kenya. Um, I would have to follow up on that. Okay. Um, All right. Thank you so much, Ian. We we, okay. <laughs> we have just one more question, and then we are going to end our session for today. Um, and this question comes from Clint Schroeder, who asks, "Do you have any insight on fertilizer prices? With prices at or near record highs, is there any relief on the way through trade policy or removing tariffs?" Well, you know, I'm no expert on fertilizer prices, but obviously the key thing is what's driving nitrogen prices is uh, the feedstock price. And that feedstock is natural gas. And um, I'm not, well, some of that may, well, you know, the world price of natural gas 
may well be being affected by the way the Russians in particular are behaving about gas exports to the European Union, which then feeds into global gas prices. Uh, Belarus has recently announced that it will uh, stop exports of natural gas to the EU because of the, um, the fight over the border and immigration between Poland and Belarus. It's not obvious to me how changes in US trade policy are gonna affect uh, either natural gas prices or fertilizer prices. Um, but having said that, I know there's a big jump in phosphate prices and we tend to import phosphate, which is the other important fertilizer in the MPK mix. And I don't think we ever had tariffs in place that I have to go back and look at that. But my gut feeling is any movement on tariffs are probably not going to affect fertilizer prices, at least in the short to medium term. I think more importantly, we're going to see those fertilizer prices feed into corn, wheat and soybean prices. Well, not so much soybean prices. And then we'll see that feeding into world and domestic food prices, is, is at least in the short to medium term. So that's it, I think, Margaret. Well, we said one more and then Ben Brown managed to sneak one in and, and given it's Ben, I think we, we might as well just let him have it. And Ben asks, uh, tangent to trade, exchange rates continue to be highly volatile. Any comment on the macro macroeconomic effects of exchange rates and a rel relatively weak dollar? And then this is where we will end it for sure. With yeah, I mean, ben gets the last question and you get the last word here. Yeah, why, why, why am I not surprised that Ben asked me about exchange rates? Um, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, I wrote about exchange rate many years ago and the thing that I was interested in was long run fundamentals versus volatility. You're asking me about volatility and that's something against which people ought over the short to medium run be able to hedge against is because we have well-functioning uh, currency futures markets. Um, but Ben, in answer to your question, I think what really matters for the overall position of United States trade, be it in the macro sense or in the aggregate level, is that the dollar is still the, the world's vehicle currency, despite what commentators think about uh, the renminbi, which is China's currency. The US dollar is still the global vehicle currency. All commodity prices are priced in dollars. And that's, I think, what you're talking about here is that any volatility weekly in dollars impacts uh, the traded price of, of, of any commodity. So there's not much I can say beyond what commentators say about volatility. But of course, what I think we should be concerned about, and we're always concerned about this, is if the US Federal Reserve starts to raise interest rates, if that if interest rates starts to increase, ink start to increase, that then gets reflected in US bond prices and yields. And then that feeds into the, you know, the capital inflows into the US economy, which then push up the fundamental value of the US dollar. And so I think that's the way I think about, um, you know, I don't see there's any day soon that the US is going to stop being, or the US dollar is going to stop being the global currency. Uh, but it, that doesn't mean to say those global, sorry, those short term volatility effects that I think you're thinking about have will go away. So yes, they're just part of the, this witch's brew that we're observing right now in, in uncertainty about uh, trade and export markets and, and, and global supply chains. Again, long-winded answer to a short question, Ben, and I'm sure we can talk about that uh, later if you want to. Okay, with that, we have no more questions remaining in the queue, and we are a little bit over time given our technical difficulties. I think we're right on the money. Um, that was a very enjoyable talk, Ian. Uh, I didn't get to stump you this time, but maybe next year. <laughs> we had plenty, plenty of good conversation from, the, from the chat, line, from the audience. Alan Lines made me think on my feet per usual, so thanks to Alan. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so we thank everyone for coming.